Galatians 22, 1 through 7. This really inspired me so much that I went back and read the whole book of Revelations last night. It was quite enlightening. And so often when we, we hear the readings in the mornings at church, then we don't even look back at them again. But I think this is really looking, looking, looks like you should go back and check it out. It's amazing. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecy written in this scroll. And as Merle would say, so be it. which we call the second advent of Jesus. So many times at Christmas, we don't think about that part. We lead all up to Christmas and then Christmas is over. But Christmas is not over. (laughs) Christmas is every single day the rest of our life, proclaiming that Jesus Christ 
came to this earth to die to save us. That is our message. That is our calling. If we truly believe, how can we not keep on doing works of righteousness? And we're going to look at some of those scriptures today. And we started with Revelation 22, the end of the story, that we see that Jesus will return. Just as much as God promised that He would send a Savior, and it, you didn't have to understand it. All the people of that day didn't understand it or they wouldn't have crucified our Lord. But that was part of God's plan. You don't have to know all the hows, whens. It doesn't matter if you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, any of those things. What matters is that Jesus Christ will return. He will have His reward with Him and He will bring judgment this time. He did not come before to judge but to save. And we have the opportunity to proclaim that gospel message. Throughout this past year we've looked at John a lot and we've spent a lot of time in John chapter 12. After that is John chapter 13, of course, where Jesus gets intimate with His disciples, where He has the Passover meal with them, the last supper that He's going to eat with His disciples before He goes to the cross. And He lays down that example of them of loving servitude, the, the most ferocious job in that day would be to wipe the muck and clean the muck off the feet of other people. How demeaning. And our Lord took that task upon Himself to show us that we should give up our lives in humble service to save others. That's the gospel message. That's what Jesus came to do. And we're supposed to be Christians like Christ. And then in chapter 14, He tells us not to worry, not to fret. Because He is going away... <laughs> But you can bet your bottom dollar on this. He will return. Oh, it's been 2,000 years. Why is He tarrying? Well, He's tarrying because He's not tarrying so that everyone can be saved. We don't know the time frame. We don't know everything that will happen. We can spend time trying to study each thing and figure it out and talking about that. Or we can just say that Jesus Christ will return and today is one day sooner than it was yesterday. And we have a mission. And there is urgency to that. We have people that we need to tell about Jesus Christ. And if it takes literally washing their feet, then that's what God has called us to do. Sometimes I think Christians simply don't understand this. They get distracted. They don't realize by the things in this world, especially Christians in the United States, that their biggest task is to tell others of Jesus Christ. It's their mission field. You don't have to be in full-time evangelism to do that. You never were asked of that of God. You were asked to be a light exactly where you are. Sure, you might have to suffer for it. Sure, you might have to have creative ways because you might lose your job even. You might be persecuted. But I can give you a ton of verses there that will tell you that you should suffer just as Christ has suffered. Why would you be surprised of that? If they persecuted our Lord and Savior, should we think we're exempt from that? If our Lord and Savior suffered and died and gave up everything, why in the world are we afraid to give up things to serve Him? He let nothing stand in the way of the cross so that He could save us. So where does the idea come from that we can just live our lives for ourselves? <laughs> It's that same old cosmic story of old. We fight a spiritual battle. It's a lie from Satan. Don't be deceived. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came to give you life. Not just life, but abundant life. Here and now. To live like He lived. In John chapter 8, Jesus said that He was the light of the world. And he goes on in John chapter 12 to call us to be children of light. John chapter 12 verse 36 says, While you have the light, believe in the light. Well, the light's gone now. But this is so that you can become sons of light. The light's not gone. The light is still here. It's you and I. The hands and feet of Jesus. The body of Christ. The church. You are a royal priesthood. 
You are the one who is called to deliver God to the people. The message of reconciliation through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus will positively, without a doubt, come again. And tomorrow will be one day sooner than today, if we have tomorrow, because we don't know the hour that our Lord will come. We just know that He will come. John wrote his gospel so that you might believe. Sometime after that, he wrote First and Second and Third John. Maybe more letters, but we know we have those three. John was written so that you might believe. Why do you think First John was written? Because there was persecution. There were people turning from the Word. There were people saying, Oh, God's not coming. It's been 20 or 30, 40 years. <laughs> it's been 2,000 years now. So John wrote his letters, and the first one he wrote so that you know that you have saving belief. He didn't want you to doubt. He wanted you to be sure of your faith. And in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7, through 7, this is what he wrote. And this is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you. God is light. And in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship, if we know God, if we are His children, if we have fellowship with Him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. I know what you're saying though. You're saying I don't walk in darkness. I don't do that because I'm saved. Well, then examine your life. Tell me what darkness you might find. I can examine my own. I don't have to point fingers at you, and I know there are dark places. I wish there weren't. But I'm still a work in progress. We look at what Jesus says, and He talks about growth. He, he tells us to pray to increase our faith. He says we can start with a mustard seed, but we should grow. So if you don't see growth in your life and you don't see areas where the darkness is going away, then maybe you need to examine it a little further. It goes on to say in verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship, look at those next three words, with one another. Wait a minute. I thought He was talking about fellowship with Himself. Well, we're back to Jesus' greatest commands, aren't we? The first and greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all that you have. Everything. Not holding anything back because Christ held nothing back. God held nothing back. The Spirit of God lives inside of you. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. Not just love, but love as you love yourself. So I can understand this more that we have fellowship with one another. That should be evidence of our salvation, that we love one another. Not tolerate them, <laughs> not put up with them, not like them either, but love them. Because Christ laid down His life for each and every one of us. He laid down His life for the world. No matter what their sin, no matter what their shame, you are no better, you are no worse. You are a sinner who is either saved by grace or not. And the difference in this world today is we're the light because Jesus said, believe in the light while you have the light so that you may be children of light. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one another. And the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. Even though you may still struggle with sin, you have been cleansed. Nothing will keep you from spending an eternity with God if you're covered with Jesus' blood. Because it is His righteousness that saves us. Because we can never save ourselves. So we needed a Savior. And at just the right time, Scripture said, God sent His Son. Even while we were enemies, Christ died for us. And He will return again. If you keep reading a little, little further, just a few more verses down, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, By this we can be sure, confident, have no doubts whatsoever, that we have come to know Him, to have that fellowship and intimacy. How? If we keep His commands. Well, wait a minute, I'll fall short on some, right? Well, the Scripture's not saying that, it's talking about a growth again. 
that you are striving to and you'll see sin in your life and you'll let the Spirit help you stamp it out. The problems that you had all this time before that you couldn't deal with on your own and never will be able to deal with you on your own. When you submit and give it to Him, you'll find out that He can take that burden from you. He promises to do that. But see, we fail to give it to Him because we think that giving it to Him means we've got to give up something else. Give it all up. Give it all to Jesus. Let Him take it all. He defeated it all on the cross so that you could have abundant life. Verse 4 says, If anyone says, I know Him, I have intimacy with Him, I have fellowship with Him, but does not keep His commandments, he is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But, complete opposite, if anyone keeps His word, the love of God has been truly perfected in him. By this we know that we are in Him. We can have that confidence. So every day we should pray, we should read God's Word, we should ask for Jesus to increase our faith, for the Spirit to reveal things to us, so that we can keep God's commandments more and more and more, so that we can be sanctified through and through, till the day when we spend eternity with God and we're completely and totally sanctified. We won't have any urge anymore whatsoever to sin. And each day right now that we still have breath, we should be approaching that day by dying to ourselves so that we can live for Christ. Verse 6 says, Whoever claims to abide in Him should, no, must, walk as Jesus walked. I started off saying in John chapter 13, He washed the disciples' feet. Well, if you read on in John, you realize that He laid down His life willingly on the cross to save us. And we're supposed to walk as Jesus walked. Well, must. The NIV says must walk as Jesus walked. Just as surely as Jesus came 2,000 years ago, He will return. How are you walking? Are you walking as Jesus walked? Do you have total assurance that you belong to God, that you are His child? That's why John followed up by writing 1 John and then why he wrote the different letters so that we could know we have that confidence. And he tells us to increase our faith, to grow in the Spirit, to be more and more and more and more like Christ. That's the pattern set before us. So if there was a book that you could read that would tell you how to become a billionaire, and this is proven, okay? It's on the New York Times best-selling list, whatever, proven you've got all these success stories that everybody had, and you have to follow this, read this book, and follow the steps. Would you pursue it? Oh, some of you wouldn't because you're saying in your own pride, I'm not worried about money, money. I've already been there. It doesn't mean anything. I understand that. Okay. What about this book that said it'll heal whatever cancer that you have right now in your life? How much attention would you give to that book? And it's true. And all you have to do is follow this. Some of the steps may cost you something. You might have to change your diet and your lifestyle. You might have to exercise. <laughs> But would you follow it if you knew without a doubt that the cancer that you had in your body would be destroyed and you would live on? What if there's a book that told you to have, know how to have peace, joy in time of suffering? Hope that's beyond all hope that you could imagine. A book that tells you that God promises to be faithful to your children and your children's children and your children's children. There is a book you know that. <laughs> it's right here. And you can find it in all kind of different versions that you can read. You can find which one you like. There's no excuse. You can, you can do it audibly. You can do it on uh, movies for some of the books. You can read it. You can have someone read it to you. You can listen to it on the radio. You can listen to it anywhere. And it promises to bring you eternal life. So how much faith and hope do you rest on these words? And the Word was flesh 
was made flesh and dwelt among us and gave His life to save us. We're starting a new year again. Another one, 2019. Did you think you'd ever make it that far? And you're going to make your New Year's resolutions and you're going to decide to lose a little weight because at Christmas time you've gained a few pounds and stuff. How much are you going to devote to God's Word? To prayer? To becoming more and more like Christ? To save your own soul and to save your children and their children? What would you give up for that? Jesus gave up His life. And He calls us to give up our life to serve Him. Not even comparable our lives compared to His. The God of all creation gave it all up and laid down His life for the very thing He created. And we take... 30 minutes to read His Word and pray, or whatever we do. And I know we have lives and everything, don't don't get me wrong, but do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Do you pick it up whenever you can? Do you turn the radio station to that station, or get you CDs or cassettes or whatever you have? I don't think they have them on 8-tracks, but we can update you to a cassette player. And put your Bible into that, and listen to it, and meditate on it. Do you? I was kind of in a funk over the holidays because on the holidays I had so many things going on that I didn't spend as much time here. And then I sat down and spent most of a day and my soul was refreshed. I got out of that funk because I hadn't been spending as much time each and every day with my father. I was still praying. I was still reading his word. I was still doing everything I needed to do, but I hadn't spent as much time with daddy. And it was obvious to me. And when I just stopped, he was right there. He never left. He's faithful. He'll give us everything we need. He's there all the time, loving us no matter what. There is a book that can do all of those things. 1 John 2, 3 said, By this we can be sure that we come to know Him if we keep His commands. And the only way you're going to do that is to spend time in the Word and to spend time praying and to spend time denying yourself, taking up your cross and following after Jesus. I told you before that after John 13, John 14 starts this way. Verse 1 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. This time of year there's a lot of people that aren't happy. There's a lot of trouble persecution because things didn't work out just the way they wanted to. But Jesus says you don't have to be troubled. You can have peace in every single circumstance. He says don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in Me. I am coming back for you. Right there. Just hold on to that thought. I'm coming back for you. So you have all the hope, all the peace that you could ever need through Jesus Christ. If you keep reading in verse 12 of John chapter 14, it says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Jesus' own words say that you will do that. And they will do even greater than these because I'm going to the Father. He said, I'm going away so that you can do even greater things. The Old Testament saints did not have the Spirit of God living inside of them. They weren't priests. They had to go to the priests to see what the message from God was. It's written in your hearts. Are you living it? Verse 14 of John 14 says, If you love me, keep my commands. Verse 20 says, On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. What day? On what day? You've got to read the Scripture. See, um, it wasn't His birth, because that's already happened. Maybe it was the cross, because that was coming up. But on that day we didn't realize what He did for us, did we? Well, maybe it's um, the resurrection. No, I don't think so either, because we still didn't realize what Jesus did for us. They still didn't comprehend. 
Maybe it's the day of Pentecost, and different commentators will tell you different things, but that's where I'm going with it. That's my thoughts. Because on that day, the Spirit of God was given to all mankind. You have the ability to read these words and let the Spirit tell you what Jesus is revealing of the Father. Because we worship Him in spirit and in truth. And without the Spirit, we can't comprehend it all. But with the Spirit, the more time we spend in His Word, the more time we spend praying, the more time we spend submitting our lives to Him, the more that His Word will become clearer and clearer to us. Will we have all the answers? No. <laughs> Will we have it all figured out? No. But He'll speak more and more and more to us so that we can become more and more like Christ. In John 14, 21, it says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And we can't keep His commands without the Spirit. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Verse 26, But the Advocate, this is why I think it's the Pentecost, the one who intercedes for us and tells us these things, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, not some things, all things. Now, as the Spirit deems necessary, but there's no barrier there. You have an open line communication to God through the Spirit, through His Word and through prayer. All things, and will remind you of everything, not some things, but everything that Jesus has said to them. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. This is Jesus. This, he is God. And then in verse 27 it says, Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. And he repeats it again. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The last candle that we lit before we lit the Christ candle was peace. So that you can have peace. Free of war, free of trouble. A life of complete and total peace through Jesus Christ. So Paul can, while, when he's in prison, say that it doesn't matter what I have. All that matters is Jesus Christ that I can do all things through Him that strengthens me, that I am content with all things. And Jesus also gives us peace because we know without any doubt that He'll return again. So if we look in the book of Acts, we can see the last things that happened with the disciples before Jesus left the first time. They're still wondering. They still don't understand they thought that Jesus was going to come to reign then. And if you read in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, they gathered around Him and asked Him, Lord, are You at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? You don't have to have all the answers. Jesus is clear here what He says. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority. But, here's what you need to worry about. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what will you do with that? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Bonners Ferry, Judea, Sandpoint, Samaria, down to Coeur d'Alene, whatever it is, and to the ends of the earth. That's what I have called you to do, to be my body, to be a light. Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid, hid them from their sight. What are they thinking? Where, where did Jesus go? What, what is he doing? He just left us these instructions and, and we have no clue what to do. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw Him go to heaven. There's the confidence and the peace that we have to fulfill the task that is before us of going and telling the world about Jesus Christ. 
And we have the Spirit to do it. We don't do it. The Spirit of God does it through us. Jesus will return the same way that He left. This time with His reward and with His judgment. He will separate the sheep from the goats. Peter writes this way about our salvation. 1 Peter 1 verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Wow. Paul writes this in Romans 8. It's this chapter about spirit life. Spirit's mentioned in it, I don't remember how many times, but more times than it's mentioned in the rest of the book of Romans. All of this done by the Spirit. And we get down towards the end in verse 31. He says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also, along with Him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us, just as the Spirit is. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Let me name a few things. Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a gracious costly, most precious gift that was given to us when Jesus Christ came that first time. So you believe in Jesus, then what did He teach? John led the way in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent means to change our minds so that it can change our hearts so that it can change our lives, how we live. So we can be saved and show others the way. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven comes near. The exact same words as what He t said that John the Baptist said. You've got to change your way of thinking. These things that you've struggled with before, you don't have to struggle with now. That life that was your own and the things that you, you put up on a pedestal and, and worship, they're not to be worshipped anymore. I'm to be worshipped. These things that stood in the way, these things that matter to you, these things that scared you, don't matter anymore. You are a child of God and Jesus came to overcome the world so that you could overcome the world. Nothing will separate you from the love of Christ that is in the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And Matthew 3, 8 in the NLT says, Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Your life will show whether you believe or not. I've said several scriptures that say that. You must walk as Jesus has walked. If you remember most of the th times when Jesus talked to the crowds, He taught in parables. A parable is a further teaching illustration, a short story, something that is familiar with, with you so that you can understand more clearly the concept that's being taught there. But this simple story, Jesus said He taught in parables so those that heard but didn't really hear and apply it to their mind to change their hearts, to change their actions, would never understand it. They would be forever hearing but never conceiving or comprehending. Are you applying Jesus' teachings? In one of His first parables was the parable of a sower. God, who came down to sow His Word. 
For what purpose? So that men would know of His love. So that men could be saved and redeemed. And so many times, instead of focusing on that, we focus on the different soil types again. What about this one? What about that one? And I've said this before because that was the theme of our vacation Bible school. And I went over that parable with my, the kids. And I said, so what about this soil type? What about that soil type? And the answer I got back from a child's perspective is, <laughs> the only soil type that matters is the one that produces a crop. And then I said, well, what about the size of the crop here? It says some produce 50, some produce 100. Well, that's really not in our control again. That's the seed and stuff. We don't have the power of life. The seed produces. Whether God's called you to produce a little crop or a big crop, He's called you to produce. You don't have to worry about any of those things. You just need to die so that you can live. Again, in John chapter 12, Jesus said we must be like a kernel of wheat and die to produce a harvest. But yet sometimes we concentrate on other things and get distracted from the true purpose of dying to produce a harvest. Dying because Christ, our Savior, our Lord, the God of all creation, laid down His life for us. In Luke 8, verses 11 through 21, Jesus tells us the meaning of this parable. The seed is the Word of God, verse 11. Those along the paths are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the Word from their heart, so they may not be believed and be saved. Pretty clear. Those on rocky grounds are the ones who receive the Word with joy when they heard it, but then have no root. We can break these soil types down. If you don't have a root, you will die. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Verse 14, The seed that fell among thorns stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked out by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they don't mature. If they don't mature, what happens? They do not produce a crop. Now I want to ask you this, why would a sower plant seed? Again, from a childlike perspective, to grow a crop. In that day, seed was precious to the people. They didn't go out and waste their seed because it meant life or death. Feeding their family or their family dying. They couldn't go down to the local grocery store. They didn't have government funds if they didn't have enough money. If they didn't produce a harvest from that seed, and they didn't know how it did it, but the life was in the seed, then they would perish. So they for sure wouldn't throw seed on rocky ground. They wouldn't throw it on a path. They wouldn't throw it on a weedy piece of ground. But God did. He poured out His seed for everyone. And it is our job to produce a crop and to plant more seed because from that kernel of grain becomes more seeds that can be planted over and over again to keep feeding until the day when Jesus Christ returns. Verse 15 said, But, complete opposite of the first three, the seed on good soil stands for those with noble and good heart who heard the, hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, oh wow, so it's going to cost us a little bit. By persevering, they produce a crop. Look at the next words that Luke writes. No one lights a lamp and hides it. <laughs> That's just plain nonsense, isn't it? Why would you light the lamp to not let it shine? That's silly. No one hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand. Why? So that those who come in can see the light. He's talking about us. 
For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be made known or brought into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what they think that they have, <laughs> will be taken from them. All the things you think are important in this world mean nothing compared to what you give back to God because what He gave to you. Now Jesus' mothers and brothers came to see Him. Okay, yeah, that's nice. But they weren't able to get near Him. When I read that, I kind of thought, what about that day when Jesus has to say to them that come, depart from me, I do not need you. And they try to justify their actions with, but we did mighty miracles in your name. We even cast out demons in your name. But they're not able to come near Jesus because they don't know Jesus. They might have even had the works of righteousness, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. So see what he says here. They couldn't come near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, thinking this would matter. Your mother and brothers are standing outside. So he could have said, move away. These are my mother. This is my mother and my brothers. But this isn't what he said. They wanted to see Jesus. Jesus replied, My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word. Is it in there? Nope and put it into practice. Because the first three types heard the Word of God just the same. It's a matter of what they did with it. Did you hide it in your heart so that you might not sin against Him? So that you would grow to be more like Christ? So that you would produce spiritual food for your family, your neighbors, your friends, even your enemies? That's exactly what Jesus came to do. And we must walk as Jesus walked. Mark chapter 4 also records that parable, and here's what it says after it in verse 26. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprout and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, when all who are going to come to God come to God, and we don't know that hour or that time, but we know that we're supposed to be producing until that time, He puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. Jesus Christ came. He died for your sins so that you could live. And He will come again to take His own back home and to separate the goats, whether they're in the pen or not, whether they're pretending to be or not, He will separate them from the sheep for all eternity. And we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ. Here's a challenge for today forward, 2019 and beyond that. Will you live a life of worth of Jesus? Or did He die just so you could keep on living the way you lived before? Father in heaven, we thank You and praise You that You would give up Your Son. That we know that eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. That He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes unto the Father but through Him. And that He tells us, teaches us over and over how to live. That all we need is... Childlike faith to come to Him, and He gladly welcomes us. And even though we don't know or comprehend, we literally have God residing inside of us to fulfill our role as priests, to be a royal priesthood gathered together, to be iron sharpening iron, to weep in times of trouble with each other, and to praise in times of thanksgiving. And Father, we do thank You for all things because the things that seem so big in this world are meaningless compared to what Christ did for us on the cross. May we grab a hold of Your Word, Your Spirit. May Your Spirit sanctify us through and through. And may we live each and every day more and more to serve You, to be more like Christ. Thank You for this church. I thank You for being part of it. I thank You for the 
the beautiful heart that is in this church and the unity of the body of Christ here. I just thank You, Father, for the precious things You've done. And I thank You for Your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.